I don't come to any of this without an acknowledgement of where I've come from. And I know that it's no small thing to be a former colored girl, Negro, black, now African American in the United States of America with a media forum that is in the homes of millions of people in the United States and throughout the world. I, I did not take that lightly, and to this day, I don't take that lightly. A group of workers staged a demonstration on Capitol Hill this week. Check this out. Metro Department of Parks and Recreation. All the employees here are working overtime. What's your reaction to all of this, first of all? I had been doing news since I was 19 years old in Nashville, and I've done every local story there is to do. These are the days where you he took your own camera and you student. shot footage with a bell and howl and came back and edited it and wrote the story. I've covered every octogenarian's birthday, every hundredth birthday. I did all the people stories, which really were harder to do than hard news. Do you get a good feeling deep down inside knowing you're gonna make somebody happy? Because you're starting from nothing. You're starting from, you're going to a birthday party for 104-year-old Mrs. Mims, and there is nothing there but Mrs. Mims's family and a bad cake. So I had done every kind of story and covered hard news as well and always felt that it was not the right place for me. But I had my father's voice in my ear, you know, constantly, well, you're making $22,000 and you're 22. Well, I don't know what else you want in the world. You better save half your money because you're not going to make that kind of money forever. When I you know, moved to Baltimore, got the opportunity to move to Baltimore, I had the misfortune to be paired with an anchor man who didn't want a young black co-anchor. He didn't want a co-anchor at all and certainly didn't want a young female one. It was a very difficult uh, position for me to be in. Very difficult. I didn't even know how bad it was because I, news I thought they wanted me there here. since they hired me. And he said there's no chance of the strike spreading to Maryland. I got a huge demotion, huge demotion. I was doing the 6 o'clock news, and they placed me on the new local talk show that was starting called People Are Talking. Let's welcome to Channel 13's People Are Talking, the fabulous Oprah Winfrey. I was given an assignment to co-host with Richard Chair who was still in Baltimore. My first interview was with the Carvel ice cream man. He has many flavors. And oh, Benny oh, from All My Children. Oh, wonderful. I came off of that stage August 14th, 1978. And I knew that I was home. I knew that in all my years of being discontent, feeling like something's not quite right, feeling like I'm in the wrong place, in the wrong job. I knew this is really? it. Yeah. It felt like home because it felt so natural. It felt like I could be myself. And when you're getting towards the magic oh, cocktail terrible. Hour, I got a hair in mine. You can have I put my, one of my hairs fell in it. I'm sorry. It felt like I could ask a question or not ask a question. I could just listen. I could pay attention. It was the most natural I had ever felt at work. One of the big treats on this diet, you can have a peanut butter and blackberry jam sandwich, which I will be having later on today. I reached a point in Baltimore where I felt I needed to grow myself to the next level, and so I decided Chicago. I started singing Chicago, my kind of town. One of the producers on my show in, in Baltimore moved to Chicago. And she called me up one day and said, look, they're looking for a person to host this show. Why don't you send a tape? So I rushed this tape and sat up all night with an editor and sent a tape in. Wow. Now that is amazing, because this is the tape. This is the tape with my bad handwriting on it. That was pretty amazing. Where'd you get this? It's in the archives. I'm glad somebody kept them. We should get a dub of this or something. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> this is the tape. I think we ought to like, uh... I would actually like to have this myself. I'd like to see what's on it. Do you have it? My name is Oprah Winfrey. 
Oprah, spelled O-P-R-A-H, and if you noticed, it's Harpo spelled backwards. Yes, I love that. That's my priest uniform. <laughs> Originally, I was named from the Bible by Aunt Ida, who named me from Ruth, the first chapter and the 14th verse, Orpa, but no one knew how to spell in my home, and that's why it ended up being Oprah. That was when I was wearing my little afro, because I'd been bald for such a long time, and I wouldn't let anybody touch my hair. And after being in Baltimore for seven years, I'm ready to come to Chicago. As I was flying into Chicago and walking to State Street to interview for the job, I thought, I just feel like I belong here. And if I don't get this job, I'm going to figure out how to get a job in this city. The unfortunate thing is every single person, with the exception of my, my uh, closest friend, Gail, said to me, you, you're not going to make it. Everybody told me that I wasn't going to make it. Those same people now saying, oh, no, we never, we always knew. But that is not true. I can understand why people say that now. Oh, yes, of course, we always knew. But everybody told me I wasn't going to. Because, let's face it, there was nobody who looked like me. I was overweight and black and female and part jerry curl. I don't know another overweight jerry curl person who can say. I made it. <laughs> to Dennis Swanson's credit, when I walked in and I said, look, you know, um, I'm black and I'm overweight. And he said, I'm looking at you uh, because I, I'm not going to be able to change that because I'd been in the market in Baltimore where once I was hired, they wanted me now to be something else. They wanted me to change my hair, change my look, get a nose job, all that. I'm not going to be doing any of that. And Dennis Swanson did me the greatest service any boss could ever give to anybody who's being hired. He said to me, you know, you know, we're competing against Donahue here, Phil Donahue. We know you can't beat him. So we just want you to go on the air and do the best you can and be yourself, young lady. Phil Donahue was the talk show icon. He defined that genre at the time. And I had nothing but respect for him and certainly didn't even consider myself even in the same category as him. So I was coming to do a local talk show, AM Chicago, which was airing at the same time right down the street from this national talk show done by Phil Donahue. Good morning, everybody. I'm Oprah Winfrey, the new host of AM Chicago, and I am thrilled to be here. Coming it was on the air New Year's Day, first day, January 1st, 1984. It is a star-studded, hour-long, live Rose Bowl party next on AM Chicago. Nothing worked. Everything fell apart. I'm cooking. I don't cook. I certainly didn't cook then, and certainly don't cook on a hot plate on TV. I figured this was going to be like the Galloping Gourmet. We had a yeah. stove here, you know, the whole hood and everything, but it doesn't work. And it was it was a mess. That's okay. I'll clean it up. Now you nervous how my kitchen is, right? <laughs> it was just one wrong thing after another. I'm talking about the fighting Illini. I didn't even know who they were. I was calling them the Illinois, and. Uh, it was, it was a total mess, but I got through it. I got through it. I got through it and came off thinking, you know, I should have asked them what the show was about. First of all, there's no audience. We'll be right back to talk to you in a moment. I thought we got to get somebody, so we'd pull people from the building. We'd go downstairs on State Street and beg people to come up in exchange for heat. <laughs> Come in, it's warm. We'll give you some coffee. And then we'd add donuts, you know. I would stop at Dunkin' Donuts in the morning myself, pick up the donuts for the audience. What a group. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning and welcome to AM Chicago. And what a morning it is. We were successful immediately. We were so successful so quickly, it was stunning, even to me. The day after the first show, I walked across the street, and everybody knew who I was. I don't mean just some, some people, I mean 
everybody. And so I thought, something just happened. I'm not sure what it was, but something just happened. Hello. Hi, how are you? How are you? Well, I'm you know, when I think about it, it is crazy. Nobody, including the Donahue people. I'm sure when they turned on the air and saw me on there, they chuckled. No, they had a big belly laugh. Uh, until the second or third day. Actually, we beat them the first day. I beat them the very first day. Roosevelt, who still does my makeup today, the third day I was on the air, I walked across the street, and uh, he was working behind the makeup counter. Roosevelt said, hey, girl, you that girl on TV? You that new girl on TV? I said, yeah, you got Come here, let me do your makeup. And so oh, I stopped for a free makeup sample to this day. That'll get me going, a free makeup sample. And uh, go, look, you let me do your makeup every day. So I ended up hiring Roosevelt. And I think Andre had seen my, Andre came uh, about a year later, because he'd seen me on TV and sent a note, sent me flowers, sent me a note or something. He said he'd love to get his hands in my hair. And 20 years later, he still is. Welcome, Roger. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Roger Ebert and I had gone on a date. <laughs> Roger Ebert and I had gone out and, and <laughs> I now guess that's what it was. I think it was a date. We went out. We went to a movie and yeah, I think it was. They're never really going to sell that many videos. Ever. Roger Ebert told me that syndication would be a good thing for my show, and that there were people who had syndicated his show who would be interested in talking to me about it. I was shooting The Color Purple at the time the syndication talks and agreements were going on, and I was really, at the time, more interested in developing a movie career for myself. I was so excited about being in The Color Purple. I had wanted that more than I wanted anything else ever in the world and so when i was told that you're gonna make this you're gonna have this big syndication deal i was like oh okay i had done the scene in the color purple where sophia hits the mayor no miss sophia no miss sophia no I did that scene and was rushing through that scene because I needed to get to Chicago in time to make the big press announcement and sign the deal. So I did that, came, signed the deal, went right back to shooting The Color Purple. In less than two months, a new show will debut here on Channel 6. It's called Oprah. She is the reigning queen of TV talk in Chicago, and it's a title she hopes to claim nationwide. I had a feeling that it was a uh, something remarkable I was embarking upon. I had no idea it would put me here 20 years later talking about it, but I, I, I could feel that it was something special. I ran across a journal the other day. I was cleaning out my drawer. And so this is September 8th, midnight, 1986. Exactly the day before, eight hours exactly before my national first show. I keep wondering how my life will change, if it will change, and what all this means. Why have I been so blessed? Maybe going national was to help me realize that I have important work, or that this work is important. Which is it? And I vacillate between letting this be the most spectacular moment ever and getting goosebumps tomorrow, or trying to treat it like an ordinary show. I think I'll end up doing a little bit of both, but I just want to acknowledge to the universe right now, to God in all his glory, my praise and thanksgiving for this experience. I know it's the end of an era for me and the beginning of a new one. Another landmark, a mighty big one. I also feel uneasy even asking God to bless 
and be with the show. I know it's already done. That's September 8th, midnight, 1986. The very first national one, oh, boy, we were up for days and nights and weeks. Thank you. I'm Oprah Winfrey, and welcome to the very first national Oprah Winfrey show! We couldn't figure out what to do. How do you say to the world in your very first show who you are, who you want to be? How do you grasp the viewer's uh, attention? You know, there has been so much hoopla about this premiere show that it's enough to give a girl hives. I've got them right now under my armpits. We had tried every celebrity in the United States. I, I mean, I had no clout. I couldn't get anybody. I've been busy these past few weeks traveling to as many of your cities as possible to introduce myself. And in every new town, people would ask, Oprah, who are the guests for the first show? I think. Uh, Miami Vice was really hot at the time, and we had sent Don Johnson so many letters, and we had tried to send him sunglasses like he needs a pair of sunglasses, and teddy bears, and flowers, and cards, and chocolates, and everything. Nothing seemed to get through. Nobody was paying us any attention, because they're like, who? Who are you? Ofri? Okra? After deliberating for some time with my staff, we decided to do what we do best, and that is a show about and with everyday people. What we ended up choosing, I think it was something about how to marry the man or woman of your choice, which actually turned out to be a really good idea, because that's exactly what people were talking about and what people are interested in, and to this day are still bachelor, bachelorette, interested in dating shows. And so that worked for us. Now, I don't have a lot of problems in my life, I have to tell you. Things are going pretty good for me right now. But two things have bugged me for years. The first, my thighs. The second, <laughs> The second, my love life. So today, how to find a husband, how to find a wife. And if you already have a mate, how to keep the one you have from all of us single people who want him. Oh, in the early days, it was wild. We had four, five of us, six in the office. We had the local staff that was there. And for the first two years, we didn't add another person. We're just a national show with the same little piddly staff. This is where a big time talk show host uh, resides. It's only after you go national do you get such plush quarters here. I would be the one to get lunch. <laughs> Shall we go to Taco Bell today? Should we be do? Yeah, I always like Burger King because it's only a block away. And um, sometimes I'd go to Wendy's and get everybody's salads, come back, forget the dressing, go back again. About four o'clock, I'd go out for Mrs. Fields' cookies, come back in. <laughs> we ate like hogs all the time. And then we'd all go drinking on Rush Street later. Yeah, we did everything. We, we all traveled as a pack. And, you know, as I started to make more money, I'd stop at the Limited, buy sweaters for everybody. There was a sale. I came back, everybody, we got sweaters. And, that's the way it was for several years. Mary Kay, let's meet about today's show. Oh, it's it's going to be a good one. They have sex. They've been divorced for eight years. Mm -hmm. They share two children. Um, and she, she pines for him. The whole show is based upon what was going on in the world, in our immediate world. We've got Robert. Good. Robert Clemmel no, owns restaurants. No, We're just we do a show based on somebody's mother. You know, my mother said she saw and we'd end up doing it. Who has comments about the stories they just heard? Raise your hand. We'd go to beauty shops where we all, you know, got our hair done or got your nails done or whatever. Morning. It was instinctive and organic from the very beginning. Oprah Winfrey now dominates the talk show circuit, both in the ratings and popularity. I, I never had any doubt once we made the decision to be syndicated that it would work. Never. What shocked me is how much money you could make. I remember the very first time I got a million dollars and I was like, 
sitting around with photographs like, oh my God, this is amazing. They're gonna give it to you ahead of time. So Gail and I were taking pictures, running around my apartment with it. Seven, six, five, four, three, applause. Yeah. <laughs> Wanted the divorce. Okay. But I never did it for the money. I never did it for the money. I was always doing it to improve myself, to grow myself, and to see how far I could be stretched. No, 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 no. This is a welfare system that your Aryan people are on because they're just you, more of you. Read, no, you read more. You took over, you took over Chicago in 20 years. You took over Chicago in 165 years. Chicago was uh, mainly white, 20 percent. In 20 years, you're 80 percent black. So you have to be breeding, ma'am. You have to be breeding very well. Let me tell you this: I haven't bred one person, not one. Not, not you. <laughs> not, not, when you're 12 and 13 years old. You don't know what you want. And if you are in a family where you trust your father, you love your father, you love your mother, and you want to be loved and trusted, you have no idea when you're put in bed to have sex with your father, right. the consequences. Do you Nicole. understand that, Mr. Elliott? Nicole, you, do, you, one thing. do you understand that you're a wait, slime? Wait a minute. One thing you know. Any idea, any topic, any kind of experience that you wanted to have, you could create. You could just create it for yourself. It was amazing. Let's meet them. The Husbands of the Year! We flew them to Chicago. And the story hit the news when women stormed the airport to get first dibs on their Alaskan man. Okay, Oprah, I need to preface this. Uh, I don't have my contacts on, so I need to rely <laughs> on integrity and honesty at this point. I really need that from a uh, young lady, so um, whoever would like to step forward and... and... Just any old body? Well, no, actually... <laughs> Fun. It was thrilling. You could invite anybody you wanted in the world to come on your show and sit and talk to you. Didn't mean they'd come, but a whole world and myriad of people did. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how long your tongue is? I hear that it's usually it's longer than most. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> it's long enough to make you my very closest friend. I think excitement is a very important thing in a person's life, you know? Getting out and doing things and when you get bogged down. What gets you excited? <laughs> My initial dream for myself of being able to stretch out, stretch out of myself and create work that would touch people's lives became true. There's one thread running through each show we do. It is the message that you, you are not alone. It was unbelievable. And to this day, I still think it is. What a blessing, what a gift, what a, one of the greatest opportunities any living human being has ever held is the opportunity to have done this show for 20 years, every day, to step into people's homes, in their bathrooms, in their kitchens, in their family rooms, in their bedrooms, in their closets, and to be welcomed and embraced and to feel like you are a part of people's lives. I don't know of another living human being who has had that as an opportunity and who has appreciated it more than I have. I don't know. Because every single day of my life, I, I, I get in the elevator and I go downstairs, I think about what that is. I think it is a, it is a privilege to have this as your work as your work, as to say that you can use your voice, 
and your voice isn't just what comes out of your mouth, but it is what comes from the interior of your soul to speak to people in a way that allows them to see the best of themselves. And for that, I am eternally grateful. <laughs>